Can you imagine being faced with a jigsaw of 3.6 million pieces? Where do you start? But if by completing the puzzle, you could help eradicate some of the most debilitating viruses the world's ever known, and with the help of a supercomputer, you might be motivated to tackle the problem. Medical scientists Jason Roberts and Bruce Thordley have constructed the first simulated model of the polio virus. The beauty of these models is that they're actually a, a simulation, they're not an animation, it's a simulation of the viral structure using biophysical computations. In the 50s, during the massive polio epidemics, a model like this would have been extremely useful to just get a general understanding of the mechanisms of the virus, you know, what, what is, know your enemy, what, what are we dealing with? The Polio Reference Laboratory in Melbourne is one of a network of labs working with the World Health Organisation to eradicate polio. Yes, I've just arrived, so I need to just get these numbers. In the 1900s, we started to see polio epidemics worldwide, and early on it was uh, mainly children uh, who were infected. Unfortunately, there's no cure for polio. But since the introduction of the Global Eradication Program in 1988, 2.5 billion children have been immunised. Reported cases of wild polio have dropped from 350,000 in 1988 to just over 200 in 2012. Three countries remain endemic for wild poliovirus, Afghanistan, Nigeria and Pakistan. Because of its place in human history and the devastation it has caused, the poliovirus has been extremely well studied. But up until now, research has only been based on static images of the virus. There's no technology available that can allow you to look at the individual atomic movements and interactions in real time. You can take snapshots using microscopy techniques or you can use X-ray diffraction and crystallography methods which are really, really complicated. There's not a lot of options available to you to actually study an individual virus particle and how it behaves. But Jason uses these images as templates to construct his virus models. So this single component is one of 60 components that are required to make up the full virus shell. And we took the genetic information and we folded that up and actually placed that inside the virus as well. You can see the genetic information in the core here, and this is the capsid on the outside. Initially it's a snapshot, but when you combine it with a supercomputer, it becomes a simulation. So how critical was this supercomputer in doing your calculations? Uh, completely vital. We wouldn't be able to do the work at all. We're talking billions and billions of calculations every second. And a desktop computer is just not capable of doing that sort of work. The simulated model allows Jason to study the mechanics of a virus at an atomic level. To test its behaviour in different environments and to see how it reacts to drugs. The drugs are now basically attacking the virus. We only are interested in this blue area here where you can see our drug wobbling around. And the advantage of having our 60 pieces that are all identical is that we then have 60 different places where we can bind the drug. And in effect, that's 60 experiments all happening at once. We can develop our methods to come up with a way to say, yes, this virus is resistant, or yes, this virus is sensitive to this drug, and then if the virus was to become an epidemic, then we may be able to predict which drug would be useful. And quite by accident, the simulation also revealed how a viral infection may occur. I'd noticed that the RNA, or the genetic information, had actually started to squeeze out of a particular split in the virus. And it was around the same time that a, a group at Harvard University had published an in vitro observation showing that the RNA came out at a particular point of the virus under heating. And when I went back to my model, I noticed that my model fitted exactly what they'd observed. Wow. Based on this and other research, Jason has been able to validate his work. We observed this behaviour in the simulations. How does that reflect what's been shown in the actual manuscripts and, and, and what's been published in the scientific community? And so far, it has been, uh, it's been accurate. With such encouraging results, Jason's now modelling other viruses. You're talking about common cold, diarrhoea, deadly brain infections. A lot of these viruses follow the same sort of uh, construction kit. And that's good news. 
given Jason has recently discovered a new virus, classified as enterovirus A120. We've actually developed a, a series of um, detection methods that we were trialling and we stumbled across an enterovirus from a, a paralysed child. When we were able to get some sequence out of it, which took a number of years of, of trying, we tested that and found that it was actually a completely new virus that had never been seen before. We were able to use the toolkit to build the virus shell, and I did that in an hour. And this begs the question, could these model simulations do away with clinical trials? Absolutely not. Every human is different, and they will respond differently to different viruses, to different drugs. So clinical trials are absolutely essential. What's the payoff? For the payoff for these models, I would hope, would be to provide a generalised toolkit that we have a series of models. Pharmaceutical companies or researchers can take the model so they can then go and put their drug inside the virus, run a simulation and actually look at the atomic level. What's the mechanism? What's actually going on here? How is this virus interacting with the drug? And does that fit with my hypotheses? I believe the development of the models that Jason has produced does have the potential to, to help with rational drug design, and so that would speed up the production of antivirals. Bio-research in a virtual world is critical because, like smallpox, once polio and other significant viruses are finally eradicated, there'll only be a few select labs worldwide that will hold these live viruses. If you were examining a virus that's known to be a killer virus, you don't need to manipulate that virus in a high security containment laboratory. You can take just the genetic information, you could email it to yourself or someone could email it to you and say, we have this dangerous virus. You can reconstruct the virus and then you can do the work in silico. You could be sitting at a desk in an office. With minds and technology like this, the eradication of polio and other significant viruses appears within our reach.